We were as brothers. We sought new lands and shared the wealth of discovery. But fate turns upon the wheels of chance. We trusted in our brothers, and they embraced us with steel. Our hearts are charred by betrayal.
Ja? Light. Hello. Wow, thank you so much for coming. So very many of you. Um, it's fantastic. So I'm John Walker from Rock Paper Shotgun, and thank you very much for coming to this panel about story to future of storytelling in games, I think we said. Um, uh, probably just be whatever we end up talking about. Um, if someone had said to me, uh, you can pick, I could pick any writers I want for a, for a panel on storytelling, I would have picked Jim Henson, Natalo Calvino, and Jonathan Swift. But <laughs> if they had insisted they had to be games, journal, games writers, I cannot think genuinely of a, be of a better panel we could have had. Um, First of all, we have uh, a man who breathes storytelling into a territory that is normally just grunts and guns. Uh, the writer behind uh, Brink, Wolfenstein, Enemy Territory, Mr. Ed Stern. <laughs> Applaud this man. Behind. Not all. Behind. <laughs> Secondly, we have the former editor of PC Zone and now uh, a contracted writer for Creative Assembly. Hello. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and um, a writer on the astonishingly loved and incredibly accident-prone pro Project Zomboid. Uh, one of the <laughs> nicest men in the business, Mr. Will Porter. Thank you. I am, just like yesterday, sat on my microphone cord. There we go. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, one of the most celebrated games writers of all time, the man behind Planescape Torment, Knights of the Old Republic 2, Fallout 2, Champions of Norrath, Icewind Dale, Neverwinter Nights 2, Alpha Protocol, Fallout New Vegas, Descent to the Undermountain. <laughs> People, it's Chris Avalon. <laughs> Added to the panel for me at the very last minute, such that I haven't written an introduction for him, but the man behind the daisy, Dean Hall. Not the Daisy, just Daisy. Either or is fine. The man behind the Warsy, Dean Hall. Formerly right. <laughs> <laughs> <Four more cards. laughs> And finally, a man with whom I'm in a deeply corrupting and loving relationship, both professionally and unprofessionally. The creator and writer of one of the most loved gaming stories of all time, The Longest Journey, and the writer of story-led MMO, The Secret World. It's Joss Whedon wannabe, Ragnar <laughs> <laughs> So guys, I want to begin with which probably what is the most obvious question, uh, which is why games? If you want to tell stories, why pick the medium that seems to put the most obstacles between the story you're trying to tell and the player who's hearing it? Because this is where storytelling is, is, is you know, being taken to the next level. I mean, games is where the narrative is being experienced, experimented with, where you know, people are really discussing it at length. Look, we're having a panel about storytelling. It's, it's where, you know, we're really trying to find new ways of telling stories. We're trying to take the old ways and convert them. I believe that games are doing some of the most interesting, challenging, and revolutionary things in storytelling. And there are great examples of, of, of that. I can take Journey, for example, from last year, one of the best games I've ever played, and a game that, to me, tells an amazing story in, in, in pictures and, and in sound. And you don't see stuff like that on TV or in the movies or in, in, in literature. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a medium where we can really push the boundaries. It's incredibly exciting to, to be working in storytelling in games, I, I believe. I think because you put the player inside the story, it gives this real uh, compelling emotional context that you don't get, uh, you know, say, so much from a movie or that where, where you're watching. So in a movie, you have more empathy because you're watching it happen to someone else. Uh, but in a game, you can actually be that person and experience the story. Because I'm not talented enough to work in film TV or right? <laughs> <laughs> And that is the honest answer. And you're saying that for everyone else on the panel too? No. no I mean, transparently not, because I know Randall's doing TV. I mean, for me, it was just opportunity. I, got, I was ridiculously lucky enough to get a job in the industry. And then I wanted to do the best job I could. And then the frustrations are enormous, but the potential's... Like, no one knows yet. We're still calling a ridiculously wide array of things game. And, like, who would have thought three years ago that a game like FTL could come? Which is, a beaut I think it was um, Tom Juber who, who, who wrote a really funny little script for that. Um, there are so many different kinds of things. Like, Anthony Johnston is a fantastic comics writer. He wrote CSR Racing, which is not a particularly story or narrative. Like, he wrote the arse off that thing. It's perfect. It's, te it's like... It's a bit like writing the manual for a washing machine, you know, it's, like, it's technical writing. But he did a great 
job on that. As a writer, I really admire that. And then, I, I, you know, I wish someone would give him the budget to go and make one of his comics as a game. But for me, it's a glass half full, glass half empty. Sometimes it's like, what's the least bad we can make this? It's a bit like um, devising the kind of chill, the, the, the school pantomime. It's 98% trying to not make it very shit. And then there's 2% kind of, oh, look, that's natural thing. Oh, well done. A fuck was given there. Well done. Well, I think that when um, developers and publishers realized uh, how much more entertaining the experience can be when you put the proper narrative backdrop on a like unconventional genre. Like I think when they added the context and all the visual storytelling in Half-Life, for example, that's what people really gravitated towards with that game. I mean, it, was, it was a fun game in itself as a shooter, but then when they added that, those other elements, suddenly I felt like the rest of the industry woke up and, hey, you know what, there's all sorts of genres that benefit from having this narrative backdrop. Although, to this day, just to play devil's advocate, I still get uh, amazed by the ability of just players to tell interesting stories if you just give them the right systems and the right tools and then you let them run across the world. Like the stories that we get about New Vegas to this day are f almost far more entertaining than any of the scripts or the cutscenes that we try to put into the game to, to, to add the narrative. It was more what the players were able to do with the characters in the environment and mess around with the world, so. Yeah, I, I think that's almost entirely like uh, entirely right because i think a lot of the best stories these days uh, they're not necessarily being told by in these in the linear stories of the characters in these big swirling orchestral moments they're being told on on youtube and on twitch tv and it's, it, it is yeah. these games like like ftl and like like like, like daisy and, uh, and a bit like a zomboid as well that, that i work on i mean that's what people are getting in, getting engaged with and i think a lot of it is just where where the bigger games kind of strike the balance between that, the exploration and the personal journey that people go on, and all the various narrative paraphernalia that, that you can sort of slot around them. Yeah. So where does that leave, if, if we're creating um, these spaces for people to create their own stories, where does that leave the, the linear story, the linear narrative? Well, I guess that's, like, I know from my perspective, I don't really consider myself a writer. I think we'd all be doomed if I was writing stories for video games. <laughs> Uh, and, um, and I noticed no one laughed there, like, so everyone agrees. Um, so yes, that's that's right, yes. Yes, <laughs> that's great. Uh, um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, the, with, with our game, it's, it's all about the player's story. So, uh, and we, we have to sort of actively try not, we're, we're actively trying to put narrative in. Anytime we're like, oh, you know, should we put a narrative in? We really don't want to. Like, we're like, oh, should we, should we explain why you're on the beach? No, we don't want to. We just want to leave that totally open. But I think that what we're driving for is a very specific thing, which is a really, we want the experience to be compelling because we want it to entirely belong to the player. Um, whereas I think sometimes, uh, you know, maybe with the more linear storylines, you're, you're trying to let the player experience a really interesting or unusual story visually and stuff like that, because we can't do that. And a lot of times with the non-linear storyline, you actually miss. Like I play a lot of Space Station 13, which I was till about three o'clock in the morning tonight. And, uh, yeah, this morning. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, that, that game is one where I think it's a lot like DayZ. You might play it for six hours and it's the worst game you've ever played. And then for 10 minutes, you have this really awesome experience. And I think you can avoid that with the linear storyline. I think with the linear storylines, like there's always a place for those, and I think there's a there's certain players that just enjoy having that that streamlined experience. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We just found that like with with open world games and games that sort of present more options to the player in terms of exploring the environment, the best you want to do is create like an interesting backdrop for them to have their player story, and then if they want to interact with interesting piece NPCs in the environment, then we try and provide interesting characters if they want to interact with them. But we don't try and make it mandatory. A lot of it is just providing a context or narrative fig leaf, if you're, if you're feeling cynical. It's like, here's what the game's about, here's an appropriate way to think about it. And the weird thing for multiplayer games in particular is, uh, you know, uh, well, you know but it's multiplayer box, but players use them in incredibly creative, ironic, sarcastic ways. We really lucked out. Uh, with Wolfie T, we didn't even do the, 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 uh, the VO for it, but there was a great, one of the, the voice actors, who was actually a developer at Grey Matter, I think, um, for, for the actors, they just had this great sarcastic sounding, sorry, which people just use, you know, terrible team kills, you know, like absolute, <laughs> just like, I grenaded you in the face, oh, sorry, it was hilarious. <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't know to what extent, like, that's not really authored narrative, but it's a tool, it's a, 
that those games are a sandbox, a, 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 a sandpit, and a, a, a rule set and a toolkit to make mar narratives with. The story of that game is you're going to play a game with your friends or some strangers on the internet. And you've been given just enough context, like, okay, it's roughly World War II, whatever it is, but it's basically a multiplayer game. We've actually stepped out of the way. We're not going to force a story on you in that way. Although that's, it is kind of interesting, because Left 4 Dead always uh, interested me, because I feel like for, 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 for solely a, largely a multiplayer game, the, just the voice barks the characters give, so, and, and the sideline conversations, and like, like uh, little snippets they give, that tells a lot about those characters in the game, but doesn't slow down any of the multiplayer action, which I thought was always, it's just always really cool, like, uh, like balance to strike. As with most Valve stuff, it's just done to an insane degree of poly I mean, like... The yeah, Valve, Valve does an okay yeah. job with something. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's a good mod team to look out for. They could do well. Uh, <laughs> but the way, the way in which, with the safe rooms, that's the place, you know, when they can engineer a quiet bit, and only then do they start playing dialogue. And it's seamless. Mm. But that's not a thing you can start doing in a multiplayer game, mainly. And I think as well, it's about how much time the player has to experience yeah, it. Yeah. So for something like Daisy and even Zomboid and that, you need to, we were talking about this before, you need to commit, your, your player has to commit a tremendous amount of time, and they're probably going to have a lot of bad experiences before they have one compelling experience. Whereas with something like Left 4 Dead, it's more like, often when I play it, it's when I've got a little bit of time, and I want to spend some time, have some fun with my friends, maybe for an hour or something, I'm not looking for a committed relationship with the game, you know, I'm looking for a fling. And, and, and so, you know, the, the story's in there, the characters are interacting, I don't have to do too much to have a, to have a compelling experience. So, uh, yesterday in your panel, Ragnar, you were talking about, uh, with the new, with Dreamfall Chapters, you were talking about these more, there's some diversion moments and more kind of sense of exploration. So it seems like even you, as kind of coming from this hardcore linear storytelling background, mm. are are spreading out this way. Do you, is this games acknowledging they're not the right place for telling a almost straight story that the player clicks their way through? Uh, I mean, who's to say, who's to define what the story in a game can be? I think games that are extremely linear can work perfectly well. Um, you know, it, it's a completely different experience. We're trying to experiment a little bit mid opening it up and allowing players to wander about and discover the story, obviously, because that is interesting as well and something that games do well. But I think the, you know, the, the, the linear story in a game is never going to go away, but the most interesting stuff is probably finding a way to blend it with sort of the emergent story, the player story, and try to find a way to sort of combine the two. Um, and, and, and that's sort of where the, sort of the revolution is waiting to happen, I think. But again, I think a lot of gamers just want that linear experience, you know, sitting down in the game and picking up the controller and sort of being led into this world and yes, having some freedom to go and explore and talk and interact with the world, but at the same time just letting the story wash over you. Do people think that games have been harmed by the sense that this, the linearity has become a, a negative? People go, oh, this game's so linear. It's almost become an insult to games. Do you think there's been a fear of linearity from developers? I think it's like, um, someone said, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that before. So I think maybe it's getting a little bit more bad press than it should, but I think that's because people focus sometimes on the newer experiences maybe they're getting from the, uh, you know, from that sort of really context-sensitive experience they have with other players. It's compelling because it's, it's happening to you from another human, and Journey is a perfect example of that where you're having these amazing experiences with someone you can't really meet and it gives this wonderful context to it. So I guess it's just, you know, it's new. And I think it's very hard for uh, a game developer to achieve that because with multiplayer, you're, you're really reliant on your players. You're relying on your players enjoying the game and playing it. Whereas with a single player, you could sell 10 copies and maybe those 10 people would enjoy it. But if you only sell 10 copies of a multiplayer game, no one's going to be playing it and no one's going to enjoy it. So it's... It's really, you know, it means it's really risky for a publisher to take that, that route. You know, they, don't, they don't really want to go down it because they're like, well, if, you know, if it doesn't take off and it doesn't go viral, then no one's going to play it and no one's going to buy it. One interesting thing I noticed was um, <clears throat> with open world games and multiplayer games where players can sort of create their own stories, um, I feel that uh, players tend to talk about those more yeah. and discuss them more amongst themselves versus... Like, Walking Dead had a very compelling story, and I enjoyed it very much. You know, I, I enjoyed the story for Bioshock Infinite. But I noticed that players don't, even if they played the game all the way through, they don't necessarily talk about those stories very much, because I, I think they both assume that they kind of had the same experience with it, which I think is kind of an interesting, interesting point. 
Yeah, I, I think that like um, you know, that's increasingly what what linear games need. They need those those personal moments where that you feel the game is just talking directly to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of games are very uh, they're very very serious, very po faced, and they just don't really recognize the fact that the player is just going to be mucking, mucking around, having a laugh, having fun. I always think of uh, Crisis as a good example, because I don't know about everyone else, but I basically used that as a, as a way I was throwing turtles into the sea, I was killing boats with fridges, <laughs> you know, and all, and all I wanted was the, the, the woman over the thing, just go, you know, psycho nomad, why are you throwing fridges at people when we've got a very important mission? But if there was that moment, then I think that, like, I don't know, there, that would be the water cooler moment, you know what I mean? Likewise, likewise, Far Cry 3, I mean, which is an amazing game, but at no stage did the, the game recognize the fact that the game I was playing was a very silly one when I was just running around massacring deer to make a new wallet. There's, a, there's a disconnect there. I mean, it's, it's like the difference between GTA and Saints Row. GTA is sort of this, you know, has a story about the man yeah. who's trying to redeem himself. At the same time, running down granite on the street, but the Saints Row acknowledges the whole thing is just like completely messed up. Mm. And that's what the story is about. You know, he's spraying houses with feces because why not? You know, that <laughs> it's at least acknowledging where you're at. And especially in open world games, you have to acknowledge the absurdity of it. You mm. do. Uh, yeah, you know, in a game where you control the story more, an RPG or a, a, an adventure game, you know, you can be a little bit more serious and it works, but once you give players the tools, you have to realize that, you know, you can't take everything so seriously. You know, I don't, I don't mean to, to talk up Saints Row, uh, the third, you know, too much, but... Uh, it's there a brilliant the, game. There, yes. it, 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 although there's two, there's, there was actually two specific narrative moments in that, which was interesting because it was an open world game, but... There was one. There was one sequence where, like, you you hop into a car with your with your companion, and like, you turn on the radio, and, and Sublime's "What I Got" starts playing, and then both you and the and the companion start singing along with it as you're driving to the mission. One of the best narrative moments I've ever hit in the game. Because I'm like, I believe that would happen. That felt like such a natural moment. And some of the cutscenes in that game. Normally, I don't. I hate cutscenes. I'm like, oh, they're taking me away from the action. I'm like, I want to get back to my character. But the cutscenes they had in Saints Row were so empowering because they gave me these windows into exactly how I was pissing off the bad guys. And I'd leave these cutscenes going, yeah, I'm making shit happen. This is great. <laughs> so sometimes, even for an open world game, there's others, there are those linear moments where I think they can just really nail and make, and make the player feel better about the actions they're doing in the environment. And, that, and that's two examples I'd probably just call out right there. So why, why do you think those... That, that moment in Saints Row 3, I completely agree with you, and the reason that I think it was so effective was because it was so human. So why, since these games are being made by humans, why are there Wait, so now few... Wait, now hold on. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was an assumption right there. <laughs> we just press F6 and it just happens. Oh. Yeah. Uh, don't oh reveal, don't reveal our identities, Ed. But, but see, I'd I, I come from more the angle. I think it would be, I think it's, it's way more compelling if, for example, you're in a car and the car could play music and then you end up both singing to each other. So I guess that's where, but it's so hard to achieve that. Like you have to have enough people playing your game, you have to put all the tools and all the stuff in and you've got to deal with multiplayer and netcode and that. So I think, but that's, that's kind of what we aim for. You know, we aim for the idea of we just, like we just put in stuff for no particular reason at all. Like we put in um, a whole bunch of complete books. That you can read like War of the Worlds, all that stuff. I think we've got 150 books now. Russian and, and Czech if people want to learn it and stuff like that. And there's, there's no purpose for it all. We have no idea what people will do with it. Maybe they'll throw them at each other, beat each other to deal <laughs> with them. Like. And so, but all of that sounds entertaining. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the job. That's, that works. But games are lacking human characters, though, because characters in games are often very functional. And now, of course, talking about NPCs, they're extremely functional. And then to give characters a, a, a life, a family, parents, children, I mean, I, I, I've been playing Last of Us, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have been doing that. And I'm not going to spoil anything, but in the beginning of the game, you're establishing this amazing emotional connection. It reminds me of uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg a couple of weeks ago. They talked about games uh, and stories and games, basically claiming, you know, there's no such thing. And I think it was George Lucas who said, well, the moment you put a controller in your hands, then you know, something turns off in the heart. And it makes me so angry because I just sat down to play The Last of Us. And at the very beginning of that game, you have a sequence where you're carrying a child, again, I don't want to spoil things, but you're carrying a child and the controller turns on, and my God, it's such an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. Your heart does not turn off in that moment. It, especially for somebody who has a child, it's like, it really, you feel it. You feel this amazing emotional connection, and you feel desperate, and that's fantastic storytelling. I think as well, like, uh, 
I think people are natural storytellers. And like I read the 4chan green tech stories of Daisy, and actually there's a few good ones of Project Zombie oh, okay. Usually you have had people die as well, yeah. hilarious <laughs> stories. And um, I don't know if anyone remembers, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was uh, a green tech story that I think happened like a year ago and it just got reposted to Reddit of some Russian guy. Does anyone remember the name? Makwa or something? Marco, yeah, so they, they want, this happened a year ago, and then it ended up hitting the top of the Daisy subreddit again, of like, it was a year ago, year ago today, Marco, that this Russian guy that he came across in the game and had this experience with. So I think it's that, trying to create those experiences that players really remember and then talk about. There's such a huge variety of stuff. We call all the thing, these things games, and whether they're explicit narrative where it's, uh, somebody has written this thing and you experience it, it's very beautifully tailored, or it's implicit narrative that, you know, sorry, implicit narrative, where, uh, no, we are telling you a thing, whether it's player, whether the player action has done it. I don't think it matters how, how that joy arrives. I was really struck, I listened to a lot of comedians' podcasts, and the only question they ever ask is, oh, that guy, are they funny? Not, you know, and obviously this is a thing in games, it's like, oh, these kinds of fun. We don't care, I don't care whether it's beautiful bit of sound design, I don't care if it's a wonderful bit of writing or a great VO performance, is it good? Like with any show, with any production, you're trying to bob a, a, a balloon in front of you, you're trying to move down a corridor. If you bob the balloon too high, it goes out of sight. If you drop it, it hits the floor, it's game, game over. It goes too far ahead of you. It doesn't matter what scale of game that is. Basically, a good bit buys you another five minutes of goodwill. And there's been times you're going, oh, I'm not really enjoying this game that much. Oh, that was good. Okay, yeah, I'm back on with you. I think in every kind of game, whatever scale of it it is, there's a contract going in between the player and the game going, Okay, um, that's got me, you know, I'm curious. Uh, that wasn't so great. You're going to need to impress me pretty soon or there's other things I could be doing. <laughs> and that could be, that could involve something as enormous as a huge scripted sequence that took 200 people six months to make. Or it could just be, that's a fucking great line of VO. Mm. Um, and the problem is, is that when you're making them, you've got no idea <laughs> what that is. Like the significance to the player, the value to the player has got nothing to do with how much effort it took to put that yeah. thing in place. So as developers, you're in the worst possible position to go, <laughs> they're gonna love this. Actually, no, they skipped it. But that bit, that little the, the, the audio book thing you wrote you know, in three minutes, that's someone's favorite part of the game. And it's great that you've got no actual control over that. So, go on. I was just gonna say, like, um, often what, what keeps me there in those uh, you know, I'm bored moments, is like if it is a game with, um, with, with uh, familiar slow burn sort of characters that you get to know, like com companions and whatever, and I think it's, I mean, both myself and John, we were talking about this before, we, in Dragon Age, we had ridiculous man crushes on, on Alistair. Alistair, and I, the reason I wouldn't, uh, I, you know, I just, I, just, I just took him everywhere, there's lots of rumours going around the camp, presumably, about us going off on our adventures, and me always choosing him, but, you know, <laughs> never to be, sadly. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but, it's, but it was, just, it was, it was, and I think it's the same with the Left 4 Dead characters. You get to know them, and it's just every now and again you'll hear them say one new line. It doesn't even have to be an amazing one, but you just feel like you are with these real people. And I think those those companions are are they are the the through line the th through games because let's face it, in most games people don't last long because everybody bloody dies mm. normally when you've shot them. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's... <laughs> Can we be friends? <laughs> bang, 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 bang. I think, but I think that's, that's the problem, especially with, with first-person ones, games when you're on your own, because they set up all these amazing characters and generally they'll be dead in the first, you know, first level. And, and, by, by the, and you've got these fearsome big baddies, but if they're at the end of the game and they die at the end of the game, how do you weave them in in the, me in the, in the meantime? Mm. Uh, which I think is why, you know, like... Um, so I say a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of Chris's games, and well, they, like that's what makes them so good because you, you've got you're, you've got surrounded by people that you know and you love. They're almost like you know your favourite characters from Coronation Street or something. Or maybe that's just me. <laughs> and, and players <laughs> want to infuse these characters with life too. We 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 put a lot more onto those. We project ourselves onto those characters. Mm. They don't have to do a lot. They mm. just have to show a little a glimpse of humanity, a little bit of humanity, and then you. You, you put so much of yourself onto that character and you make them real. You know, I, th yeah. I think relationship is, is, really, is really key here. So, uh, just random examples, like I think at the beginning of, of Dreamfall, the fact that Zoe has a dad. I mean, how many game characters have a dad? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Or um, in, in, in Planescape, the fact that the Nameless One has, has Mord, right? So, you know. As, as cursed as that is. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, an, an, in, it's instantly a relationship. So many games seem to be lacking relationships. I was wondering if you guys have any ideas why that is. Because it's incredibly hard to get right. For me, sorry, this is uh, this is going to sound ridiculous, and it is. If there's a graph between player attachment and kind of 
visual fidelity, kind of the uncanny valley graph. There are little plateaus, like, oh, this is incredibly basic, and, you know, like, uh, oh, Thomas was alone. Brilliant, hardly any visual fidelity whatsoever, loads of human attachment. And then if you increase the graphics by 10%, actually it would get less fun. And then there's another plateau a bit later on of, oh, you know, they're, they're kind of stylized, but they're kind of like, um, oh, Lord, The Walking Dead. Very illustrated looking game style, but it really works. The performances are exactly the right size. And then you go up a bit, you know, you put more effort into mocap and stuff, and it just gets weirder. It, you know, it, it's not as effective until suddenly there's Avatar right at the other end. And those plateaus sh change position over time. Like FTL, if it had come out three years ago, the graphics would have been bad, not charming. You know, it wouldn't have seemed like, oh, what a brilliant retro choice. Look, the clunkiness is actually incredibly meaningful and satisfying. I think that changes a lot. If anyone had said five years ago, in the future, everyone will be on PC making incredibly violent, funny, ironic SNES games. No one would believe like, that. Would, that doesn't sound like fun, but there's a huge amount of sati like There's a really good bit there. Well, it's, it's, so, with that, it's like, yeah. I, f I found out about it by people telling me stories about times they'd had, yeah. you know, on Hotline Miami and that. And I saw a, a comment on one of the E3 videos about DayZ, someone saying, it looks like a game from the 1990s. And I actually took that as a compliment. <laughs> this is, this is DayZ. Yeah. And I was like, oh, sweet. Because, you know, a lot of the games I played then, I really enjoyed, you know, the really crushing nature of the games and even the graphics style as well. Yeah. I, I actually would probably take the, the track that I, I don't think attachment with companions is necessarily that hard to do. It depends on how you design those companions. So for example, I thought it was interesting for the Call of Duty uh, recent reveal that everyone got attached to the dog, which I did not think was surprising at all, because like one of, one of our best companions that we ever had in the Fallout series was just dog me. Like, he was your loyal companion, like, he didn't have a single line of VO, but the fact that you had this animal companion in the environment, he was extremely combat effective, which I think is really important for companions to be. He served a useful function in the, in the game mechanics. But he didn't need a lot of dialogue to make that happen. Then New Vegas, we had Eddie, who did like his little beeps and chirps. Like, he's your buddy who follows you around. He's combat effective. You can form a really strong attachment without him actually having voice, having like a, a human personality, as it were. And one thing you said about Walking yeah. Dead, I actually, I mean, it's what you're saying in the sense of those aren't lifelike, you know, uncanny valley, horrible, realistic characters because they have the comic book animated style and have the exaggerated expressions even when they're not saying anything, does so much more to convey what's going on with that character in the story. And anytime I hear the, the load of crap about, well, you gotta make these characters look super realistic in order to get the character, like, get the player invested, fuck that. Like, I'm like, Walking Dead, just look at those characters. Like, and like, Thomas was alone, like, absolutely. Like, you don't need that, that, that horribly uncanny valley zombie-like, you know, uh, fidelity to create attachment to characters at all. Like, I think it actually gets in the way of that. I think as well, like, and maybe one of the reasons that I'm not, I don't play a lot of single player or linear games is because I get really sick of the companions. I call it the Jar Jar Banks effect. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, it's this guy again, and you try and shoot him and he doesn't die, and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sucks, you know? And, and so, and, and I guess it's, it's coming back to what you were saying before, is sometimes you, you, you're falling around or you, you really just don't want this guy hanging around, but if the, the writer's really wanting to have this compelling experience, and I'm like, I don't like that guy, you know? Isn't Why doesn't he just go do his own stuff? Don't, 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 don't kind force of, him on me. Like, yeah. please, isn't it for great the love that, of God, do not do that. <laughs> also, I kind of like the fact that you don't, you don't like him. I mean, there are always people in my, I'm playing a role-play game, there's always some guys, like, oh, I hate that guy. It's like, well, you, you get back to him and all of a sudden you realize you haven't taken him out on a mission. Like, oh, so you have to spend out five minutes leveling him up to catch up with the rest of the party. That, that was, yeah, and it was, it was something I always enjoyed about four that was, I didn't like that guy, bam, there we go, he's dead. Might, might cause me some issues later on, but at least, uh, <laughs> at least I could kill him if I wanted. Yeah, the, the, the moment any narrative designer you know, has that opinion that you need this character to tell the story, like he has to be there, he has to convey this information, immediately I'm like, nope, you are absolutely wrong, find another way to do it, do visual props, do it through the level design, do it through the graffiti in the environment. There are tons of ways to communicate a story that doesn't require an invulnerable NPC to follow you around and be jar-jarring you all the time. Like, no <laughs> way, like, that's just bullshit. I, I Sorry. really want to open it up to audience questions. Sorry, guys, because I was going to run out of time. So, um, if uh, have a question over here. Sorry, if you've got the microphone, can you stand up and... Can I just fill really quickly while someone's do. getting the microphone? You know the big dog robotic, like quadrupedal army robots? You, know, you ever seen the YouTube videos of this? It's like a load-carrying robot. The whole point of that is that you've got this thing that will carry heavy loads, and it's not human, so it doesn't matter. They were the US Army was testing them, 
And they said, no, it doesn't fucking work. I said, well, what's the problem? Because the men are really attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> and they will put themselves at risk to rescue it. <laughs> it doesn't have a face. If, it if, doesn't have any lines of VO. If, if but they, it's like, look at that. If they had played Half-Life 2, they would know that. <laughs> <laughs> And also there's a blinding light, so it's kind of hard to see you. So if we're, if we're looking off in left or right directions, it's because of the light. Hi. Uh, one of the game shows that really got to me in the last couple of years is Spec Ops Online. I wonder if any of the panel have played it or anybody here has played it. Um, Spec Ops Spec Spec the Line, people played it. I, yeah, I, play, I played it, and I just thought it was absolutely fantastic from, from start to finish. And then it, from the, like, the amazing treatment of, of Dubai itself as almost this kind of almost rapturesque kind of... Uh, kind of setting to, uh, it just did some really, really clever stuff. Oh, it's one of those things I don't want to, don't want to spoil it. There's, there's, a mo there's, there's, there's a moment when you actually play something that's very, uh, that doesn't actually turn out to be true, but, and then it just it, it reverts with a, with, a, with, a, with a quick load after you probably die. And it's just little stuff like that. It just plays, plays at the edges of what you expect in what is a generic third-person shooter in terms of at least the way it, it plays. Yeah, but if you haven't played it, seriously do, it's yeah, excellent. I, the interesting critiques that I've heard about that game, although, is that um, for people that enjoy that style of game, it sells itself very much as being like, hey, you're going to play a Call of Duty game. But then the progression of the game is they actually condemn that kind of attitude and that play style, which I'm kind of torn about because it's an interesting critique of it. Yeah. But if you're selling that as entertainment to the player, then I have a question of responsibility in terms of... You're does selling it, it as one thing. And then yeah, does it ultimately it. end up being entertaining for people that wanted to play that kind of experience? Although, I, although at the same time, like, because it's subversive, I'm like, hmm, that's actually very fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I played it, and I wish I'd enjoyed it more. I, I oh. really admired what they did with it. I think it was a really interesting experiment. It just felt really finger-waggy to me. Like, ha-ha, yeah, you see? It's like, yeah, we, like, we know we know. <laughs> and I hate being that guy. I generally really want to enjoy things. I, I, I thought the intention behind it was fascinating, and, and really some very smart people worked very hard on it. It just, it just didn't work. It's such, it's, such a genre, it's such a ridiculous genre anyway, in a way. I have no idea how to write a Call of Duty game. Thank, no, it's not going to be a problem, but I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you do? I mean, you know, the first Modern Warfare 1, Call of Duty 4, that's a great bit of writing. That's an amazing, that, there was some, you know, proper System Shock 2 size, <clears throat> wow, I didn't realize you could do that in a game moment. But it's diminishing returns after that. How do you make Shooter of the Year, you know, again, you know the fifth one of those? How irrational managed to make a new Bioshock. They paint themselves further in the corner every game they do. I couldn't believe what they did. I thought, that got, I, I thought uh, Bioshock Infinite got some really unfair criticism. It was like, oh, but the verbs contradict the theme of it. It's like, look how much they've put into the modern shooty bang mass market media game. That felt like glass half full to me. But then it's, those games are just so hugely hard to make. Look how much they put into a mainstream game. I thought that was, a, that was amazing. Sorry, that wasn't an answer to that question. Christian, did say? Do you think there's a place for multiplayer branching narrative driven games? So imagine if in Mass Effect there were two shepherds. So you would play with your friend and then have arguments about what you should do, and then that would be reflected. So you may want to cure the gene of fade and your friend might not, and then the shepherds will argue in game, and then they will start to reflect the personalities of the player. So it's like a loot drop in World of Warcraft. You argue, you bid for, I think we should have this ending. Uh, I, don't, I think that would work in a, in a cheaper, smaller game. The trouble is, it's all this content you don't get to see. Yeah, I mean, be, and that's one of the weird probably things. Probably wouldn't about, have combat. When yeah. playing Deus Ex, or what, I, don't, I don't think it's the case that you can just skip Paris. But there's huge chunks of that game that just are, are optional. And if it's a bit, if it's a, you know under a publisher model, they're just not going to let you make game that people don't play. I, I think it's largely a resource issue, and I think it could be solved. But I think it, it would be an expensive undertaking. And you'd probably have to figure out an, an, interaction, an interaction system that would, be, that would work well in a multiplayer game to have it be like, uh, you know, really instantaneous, like no slowdowns. You have to be really careful about how yeah. you did the dialogue. You'd probably want to do something that's more action driven, like, hey, if both shepherds head down this corridor, as a simplistic example, that actually reflects a decision <laughs> later on versus suddenly like you, turn, like you start shooting each other to try and figure out who can kill the other one first so you can go shut down the reactor or whatever. It'd have to be much more action driven in a multiplayer game because you wouldn't want to slow anything down. But I, I do think it's feasible. 
I mean, not everybody can be a hero, and that's the problem with MMOs. I mean, I find it, you know, always so absurd when I play, you know, World of Warcraft, and I, and I, I you know, I do a quest, I save a village, and they're like, yes, you're the chosen one. He's right behind me, there's another guy coming <laughs> in, and he's going to hand in his quest. They're going to do the same thing. They're liars. I'm not the hero. Uh, actually, with The Secret World, we sort of, the theme of the game was that, you know, you're, you're playing as ostensibly the hero of a game, but you're a part of an army of heroes, and people sort of comment on that. I mean, it's... It's the only thing you can do in a way because it's so absurd. You're not doing anything. You're not really saving the world because the world keeps on living. You're not saving anyone. You're sort of buttering your own cake. Is that even a word? <laughs> and, you're, and, and, and everybody else is doing exactly the same thing. You're not, you're not the hero anymore. You're just some guy who's out to sort of earn points and, and get loot. And, and, you know, nobody's a hero. And you have to sort of address that, I think, in a multiplayer game. That's why I, I, I really don't like that whole hero effect. But, I mean... I really don't like, people ask me if I like a particular game, there's very few games I like, like at the moment I'm playing a lot of Space Station 13 and it's a free game and it's like a top down, like, I don't know, it's kind of ridiculous to describe, but I think that once good developers realise the kind of game, like, you know, that, that players really want to play a game like DayZ that just lets them play something, then I'm kind of screwed. But until now, like, because because people were trying to log in and it was taking them like four hours to log in, and then they'd have to wait like an hour for their character to create. So people which like, is a story in itself. Which is yeah, which <laughs> is a story in itself. But so I think yeah, I mean, I talked to Ubisoft at E3 about um, uh, the division, and I went and had a look at, it, and I see what they were trying to do, and they were explaining, well, we saw this, you know, we're big, you know, big publisher, big company, we really, but we want to try and experiment with this, um, and I think that. Yeah, uh, was it Total Biscuit called it the desperation genre? Like where players are just so desperate to play this game that makes no judgment about their play style, it has no story at all. Uh, like people, people ask me, why do the players spawn on the beach? And I'm like, I don't know, because <laughs> love we it. wanted people to go north. Like we wanted <laughs> yeah. north to be real. Like there's no real reason, and, and so people can't get about, that. So much about games is like you know breadcrumbing stuff or going you go this way. Games that are just indifferent. Like you know, Daisy does not care whether you die or not. That's what's delicious about it. There's a brilliant uh, mobile game called uh, by Tiger Style called Spider: Secret of Bryce Manor. Mm. Yeah. Which I think is some of the best like games writing I've ever seen. You are a spider. It's a beautiful touchscreen mechanic. You're a spider. You go around, you go through this house, you eat bugs, you leave cobwebs, that's, you catch things in your web. There is an amazing mur ro romance murder mystery story there, to which you are completely indifferent. You're a fucking spider. What do you get? <laughs> <laughs> You're not like in Inspector Spider of the Yard. You know, uh, so you go down the sink, and oh, someone's thrown a wedding ring. Yeah, it's, and it's incredibly. It's all through game. visual props. Like yeah. that, that, yeah. that game is a great example no of visual dialogue. storytelling. Like it's not like a spider suddenly breaks into like a talking interaction with like you know. Turns to and, camera. And, and <laughs> 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 no, this is exactly what games can do. You cannot, you cannot do that in a movie. You know, you can or, or a TV show. You can't like embed the story in the background. You're sitting there watching stuff. Although I think the sort of police school TV show actually did that. You watch the background. There's a lot of stuff going on. But but the games have this tool where you can see the player can pause and explore and investigate and and discover these stories and that I mean, the tool set we have in games is so massive. We have the tools of every other medium and, and that's, you know, the spider is a good example of that where you sort of have the game mechanics but, it, you know, behind it all you have the story that sort of exists by itself. We, 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 we've got the tools for every other medium but they are inverted in terms of cost and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Very, very briefly. The thing that every student production, the cheapest film, gets for free is the human face reacting. Of your favourite great moments, cinema moments, most of them are people listening, not talking. That's what you get for free, and it's the most expensive thing in a game, unless you've got an art style like Talking Dead, which is very evocative, and you can, you know, you can empathize through it, and we achieve catharsis, and everyone goes home. Um, but, uh, um, you know, what, in a game, if you've made a building, it's not that much more expensive to make it fly around. You know, once you've made the first explosion, you can copy and paste <laughs> that. This is not true of movies. You know, like, everything's back to front. A two sh the one shot of an actor reacting is the most expensive thing in a game. You can't do it, and somebody's animated the eyes weird, so it blinks out of concert. There is no script or VO performance that cannot be destroyed perfectly by having someone blink at the wrong moment. And quite often, the animator who's doing that is just busy and frantic, and that, that stuff gets... Clearly time together. for a return to FMV in gaming. That's obviously yeah. <laughs> not completely good. Do we have time for one more question over here? I, um, I play a lot of Dota 2, and something that I notice is that uh, in-game, occasionally you get uh, two heroes talking to each other. It's um, to see the two heroes reacting, even despite the fact that you hear them constantly throughout the game to the point of getting slightly annoying. Uh, when, uh, when two heroes chat to each other over, over chat with someone, I actually just squealed in joy. 
how do you write for sort of two character interactions just within multiplayer games? That's what I've got to do on Monday. Um. <laughs> I guess I, I'm, I'm from the extreme point of view. I mean, I just, I don't like multiplayer games that have story. The only one that I kind of liked was, I think it was AVP, Alien vs Predator 2, and that didn't even actually have a cooperative mode. It, someone made a mod that allowed you to play the single player campaign cooperatively. Oh. And it was really awesome. Yeah, they made this, this DLL wrapper that allowed you to do it. And it was buggy and it crashed. That was actually quite fun because it was a terrifying, um, you know, it was a terrifying script. And yet you could actually have a friend and then your friend would die. And because it was really harsh because there was no way for you to respawn because it was, it was someone had modded the game so that it had it. So it was really brutal and cru cruel. So I come from that extreme, like uh, where if I'm playing a multiplayer game, like we play a lot of Crusader Kings 2, you know, I love it how... All this awful stuff happens to us, and we're all yelling and screaming at each other, and someone accidentally declares war on me who's in the audience when they were supposed to declare war with me. <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that kind of stuff is kind of my end, but I guess this... I th yeah. For me, it's like either you've got... They say one thing, and they only have to say one thing, or they say one of five things, kind of, you know, TF2, all brilliant and all fantastic, or they say 11 billion things or nothing. Like, there's no... There's, like, there's nothing that repetition won't turn tedious eventually. So th there was something in the first Halo, there were just some very rare lines that would hardly ever play. So there was one where, you'd, you know, there'd be that th thing where you finish the firefight, you still got a, a couple of Marines alive. And then only one, I only saw it once, one of the Marines just ran over to a dead end and said, he moved, he moved, I, 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 I'm sure he moved. And I never saw that again. It's, when, <laughs> when's that going to happen again? That may be the only time that thing triggers. But other than that, like, it's like, oh, that's a really funny line. Uh, it's kind of fun the second time, now it's boring. And so the temptation is just to have, no, let's just have one good line. And every time you hear it, that's, what, that's effectively you declaring your move, which is how we did it previously. Um, the Dota thing is brilliant, but they're relatively rare. It's like these combinations of characters, and they don't fire every single time. But the problem is, unless, as long as you've got the time to work out the value to the player, when you write that, it's like, oh, and here's a list of hilarious things that people say, and it's just a list of things that people are going to hate. Because yeah. they're going like, to enjoy each of them the first time once. And then it's like, you're still saying that thing. Oh, God. <laughs> Guys, I'm afraid we have to stop here. Um, I think it's been absolutely fascinating, and I would love to just sit here all afternoon, but I think the other panels may get annoyed. <laughs> but, um, guys, thanks so much, and I, yeah, I hope you've had a good time. Give these guys a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Who's on? What's the next panel? Sorry? Lambdeer. Vlambeer. People who <laughs> yeah, hate Vlambeer. stories. <laughs> you, you will have seen setting up during, during the talk over here. So they are up next. If you're interested in that, I'm afraid you'll have to leave and queue up again. But thank you very much for coming and see you again soon.